Okay, welcome everyone to our A to J Author Supplemental Training. This is Jessica Frank. I am A to J Author's Program Coordinator. Thank you all for sticking around for these two extra um, supplemental days on just A to J Author. We'll have about an hour or so today, and then another session next Tuesday, same time, 11 uh, Central, noon Eastern, um, for additional training. If um, you are new here, um, the supplemental training is part of LHI's um, annual live training. We're doing it virtually this year. Um, we've had five sessions, a mix of mostly hot docs and a little bit of A to J author. So we've made these two supplemental trainings just on A to J author to get you more immersed for those of you that are going to be using A to J guided interviews as your front ends. So welcome to um, any newbies and uh, thanks for sticking around, any of you that have been with us for the last five weeks. So on our agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between A to J Author 4.0 and A to J Author 5.0. During the um, hour I had a couple of weeks ago um, during the LHI training, I focused just on 5.0. 5.0 is our um, version that rolled out on August 1st. For those of you that are here today, we're going to be switching back and forth between 4.0 and 5.0, and that's because 5.0 isn't up on LHI servers yet. So anyone who needs to get a project going right away is going to have to use A to J Author 4.0 until probably early 2015. Um, we're working with LHI's technical team to figure out exactly when we can get 5.0 up on their servers. Um, then we'll talk about specific training resources for 4.0 that will help you um, as you're working through creating those interviews, those guided interviews. We'll talk about conditions, functions, and then I'll leave time at the end for any questions. So the first thing we'll talk about is the difference between 4.0 and 5.0. And one of the big differences from 4 to 5 is that we've updated our look. We've gotten basically a 21st century makeover. We have six new guide avatars, including male avatars. In 4.0, there was only a female guide. So we have three new female avatars for guides, three new male avatars for guides. We also have new end user avatars that are more refreshed, a little bit more um, 3D looking. We also have three new skin tones. So in 4.0, there was blank and tan. Blank was the color of um, a piece of paper, tan was slightly darker. So we've gone for a more diverse skin tone range that you can see here. The skin tones are one, two, and three. No labels assigned to them, just one, two, or three. And you as the author can select whether you want female one, female two, female three, or male one, male two, male three. As with 4.0, whatever skin tone you select for the guide avatar is going to um, control for the end user's avatar as well. But the end user can choose whether to have a female or a male um, end user avatar for them using the gender question. 5.0's flowchart, or the big picture outline, for those of you that are new, our flowchart is, is a map. It gives you kind of the, you can see the, the forest for the trees. The trees are the specific little questions. The forest is the big outline picture. In 5.0, which is the bottom screenshot here, it's slightly less graphical, but it is still just as functional. 4.0, you can see at the top, is basically a picture of the question itself which was great, and um, it was written Flash, so Flash can do a lot of beautiful pictures that our new version in JavaScript and HTML can't do, but um, the JavaScript HTML for 5.0 is a much richer environment and significantly better for basically everything else besides um, pictures of the questions. Same functions though from 4 to 5, so anytime I'm talking about the flowchart or the map, called the map in 5.0. They're the same basically from 4 to 5 except for the picture representation. Um, in 5.0 we've added a new tab that's called files. Files shows all the files attached to your guided interview. In 4.0 you could only see this if you went to the upload tab um, when you were going to upload your interview to the server it would show you what files were associated with that upload. Now you can see all the files that are associated with your interview independent of the upload process. So this will show you all audio, MP3s, all video, um, MP4s, and all pictures, XML files, anything that is associated with your guided interview. For those of you that are new, these kind of things adding in audio for learn mores or questions 
adding in pictures or videos as possible in your um, in your Learn Mores. You can add in XML files. So instead of typing in a list of all 50 states, you can just upload the US states XML that's part of our 4.0 starter kit. And then all your states are in alphabetical order. Um, people use XML lists for counties as well, so you don't have to type in every county. You can just create one XML list that can be used from guided interview to guided interview. Speaking of the upload tab, so here on the left is 4.0. And you can see that files to upload, all the files that were associated were, with this interview were just the .a to j file. But this is where in 4.0 you would see if there were any XML, MP3, um, or Flash videos attached or JPEGs. Um, upload in 5.0 is now called Publish. There are, for those of you that are going to be uploading A to J Guide Interview 4s to the LHI server, um, there are training resources on LHI's document uh, support page where the same places you've been going for um, your homework and for the um, recordings of past sessions. They have how to upload to A to J or how to upload A to J guided interviews to LHI. Um, so if you have questions with how to specifically upload to LHI that is available on their website. And as I mentioned, we are working with LHI's technical team on implementing 5.0 uploads shortly. So keep an eye out for that announcement around the new year. A really cool new feature in 5.0 is all logic. It shows you all of the logic or advanced conditions running in your guided interview. So anywhere you see red, which is just this bottom question here, it means your logic is broken. There's something wrong with it. Many of the errors though aren't that scary. So 5.0 is stricter than 4.0. When we first started going through this, I was really concerned about having to explain to you all the errors and that we would hit a lot of them, but it turns out a lot of the errors are simple things, little careless errors that pass in 4.0 that aren't gonna pass in 5.0, like forgetting to close your quotes or parentheses, um, little things like that are, that are quick, easy fixes if your logic is broken. And we have an FAQ on our website, adajauthor.org, that contains um, about seven or 10 common errors and how to fix them. So it shows a scripting error and it shows a specific fix to that as well. So you can refer to that under our FAQ section on the new website. Another new tab is all text. So all text is pretty self-explanatory. Um, it includes all of the text in your A to J guide to interview. But a cool new feature is that you can use Control F on your keyboard to do a search for spelling errors and then you can do a quick replace with those as well. Instead of having to click through every single question in 4.0 to find, you know, if you misspelled judgment or your variable name was misspelled, here you can quickly do a search and replace using the all text field. And then finally, for testing purposes in 5.0, the scripting and variables windows are along the left side instead of pop-ups. So in 4.0, you would click variables um, and scripting window, and then it would pop up two separate windows, one being the variables, one being the scripting window. Here, when you click either the variables slash script at the bottom, or you click our A to J author logo at the top, it opens up this left pane where you can access, um, you can see what's going on behind the scenes for the scripting window, which is awesome for testing. And you can also see what variables are being um, filled in with each question as well. So our new community website is designed to support our authors, to help all of you. It's geared towards 5.0 because that's the forward direction we're facing. But we have links to all of our old 4.0 resources as well. So we, um, the old community website, if you've ever done any, if you've ever visited our, our old website before, is still up. And all of those resources are still available, training modules, starter kits, XML files, training videos, all of that, still available at old.a2jauthor.org. That's old.a2jauthor.org. But you can find the link to it on our new website, which is a2jauthor.org. We also have our FAQ section for 5.0, and we'll get our um, 5.0 starter kit up there shortly. We have a YouTube channel with over 40 videos on it. We have um, Hot Docs resource videos as well for those of you that are new to both Hot Docs and A to J author. We update this um, training 
resource monthly. Every month we do a A to J author new user call where we talk about one specific issue. Going forward, all of those are going to be on 5.0, but we've recorded all of our past new user trainings as well. So those of you that are going to be working at 4.0, you can find all of those training videos as well. Each video is about 15 to 30 minutes long, and it's on a specific topic, which will be expo which when you click on, if you go to YouTube, you can see specifically what topic is being discussed. So for example, this larger one here is specifically on repeat loops in 4.0. Anything that's A to J author 5.0 will say that right in the title. So you'll know if it doesn't say it, it's 4.0. If it says 5.0, you'll know that it's specific to the new tool. Specifically for this first part, I'm going to talk about advanced conditions in 4.0. When, when I finish the section, I'll show you how advanced conditions differ in 5.0 as well. So on our agenda, um, we have what are conditions, getting started, an overview of conditions, then we'll talk about the event, the actions, condition operators, condition syntax, and additional resources. There is a big difference between conditions in 4.0 and 5.0, but a lot of the concepts that we'll cover here are um, transferable. So it's, it's not a waste of time to learn how to do it in 4.0 if you're just going to be working in 5.0 as well. And it always helps to see what's coming forward in the future for 5.0. So what are conditions? Conditions are simple if-then statements. Conditions evaluate a scenario and apply that action accordingly. So if something is true or false, then tell A to J author to do something based on that information. Again, this is in 4.0, so this is what it looks like when you create a condition to get started in 4.0. You go to the Advanced tab on your question design window, and you it's blank, and you click the plus button to add a condition. Once you click that plus button, up pops the field for an event, the condition, the action, and then any notes you have. The conditions, um, there's four parts here. So condition, event, um, and action. And the conditions at the top, is a, this one is a summary of all the conditions that are for that specific question. The event is when to test for that question, or for that condition, excuse me. Either after the user presses the button, after they hit the continue button or whatever button you've assigned, or before the question is displayed. The condition itself is what A to J author is evaluating. And then the actions, this first box under the word actions is a list of all the actions, just like this is a list of all the conditions. The action is what to do if a condition is met. So if true, and this is a drop down, so you can also have if false, the action can either be go to question and then designate which question to go to, or the action can be set a variable and it would have a pop-up list of all, um, you could type in what variable was supposed to be set. Conditions are tested in the order in which they are listed. So this is important for 4.0 and 5.0. Remember, conditions are tested in the order in which they are listed. So if one is true um, and that or false and that action is to move on to another question, a to J author is never going to evaluate your other conditions. So make sure you put your conditions in the order in which you want them um, dealt with by A to J author. You can have up to 50 conditions per question. So you can have a lot of conditions in there, but again, remember, conditions are tested in the order in which they are listed. The event, there are two options when A to J author can evaluate your condition. Either before the question is displayed and after user presses the button. So um, if before question is displayed is your option and the condition is evaluated should be true and then the action you set is to move on to another question, that question is never displayed to the end user. I'll show you an example of this in my 5.0 uh, sample that I have, but the one is um, I ask in an earlier question, are you a male or female? And if they answer male, then on a, on a condition before the question is displayed, I, um, on the question, are you pregnant, if they've selected male previously, I don't ask the are you, are you pregnant question. But the condition is if, if they've selected female, then to display the question because I want to know if they're pregnant or not. You can also test after the user presses the button. That question is always shown to the end user. So if it's something you want to hide from the end user, you want to do it before a question is displayed, 
If it's something that should be evaluated after the end user sees the question, then you select after user presses button. The action. So if a condition is met, there are two possible actions. You can go to another question, which is the top option. You can see after age, they're evaluating what the client's date of birth is, converting it to a number, age, evaluating whether that is less than 18. If true, so they're under 18, they shouldn't be using this form. I want to take them to a question that says, sorry, you don't qualify. You can also use a condition to set a variable value. So here I'm setting if I'm evaluating whether number of children and you, so that's the number of children I've asked in a question is greater than one, then I want to set this new variable, child or children TE, to children. If false, I want to set that same variable, child or children TE, a text variable. To child. So it'd be like customizing it later on. If How many children do you have? If they only have one child, then later on I want to say, what is the name of your child? Where does your child go to school? Who is your child's father? If they have more than one ch um, child, then in those subsequent questions, I want to customize it to say, what are the names of your children? Who um, is the father of your children? I want to um, make it either singular or plural based on information they've already given me. You can have multiple actions based on one condition. So if we go back to that last screen, I have multiple conditions based on this one, and multiple actions based on this one condition. So whether or not child, number of child, sorry, number child NU is greater than one is either going to set this to children or it's going to set it to child. So that's one condition, multiple actions. In this example, I'm evaluating whether income NU that's some, I asked a question, what is your income, is greater than 35,000. If it's true, I want to set a variable, income too high, TF to true. So say my, um, my form, they're ineligible to use my services if their income is over 35,000. So I wanna set that to true. I then want to take them also to the exit question that says, I'm sorry, your income is too high. If it's false that they're less than 35,000, I want to set that same income to high TF to false, and it would just move on to subsequent questions. So it's setting a variable, it's sending them on to another question, if true, and if false, it's just setting the variable, and then it would branch normally. Condition operators, an operator is used to compare variables and data in conditions. So in that last example, the greater than sign is a condition operator. Variables can be uh, evaluated in a condition using a variety of operators. So equals, less than or equal to, um, greater than, less than. You can even use the word is. All of these are found in our A to J author guide as well, if you want to refer back to them. As an aside, I'm also working on updating our authoring guide for 5.0. So for those of you that are getting um, into starting into A to J author 5.0, our new authoring guide should be up shortly as well. Variable names for condition syntax. Variable names must be enclosed in brackets. Cannot say that enough. They must be enclosed in brackets. This is especially important when you're dealing with conditions. So in general, if there is a space in your variable name, so the space between income and NU here, you must have a bracket wherever you use it in A to J author. It is especially important to have the bracket around it in a condition. As with spacing though, in general, around the condition itself, you can have a space or no space around the operator. That doesn't matter. If there's a space in your variable name though, you need to have a bracket around it. Otherwise, it will not evaluate properly. Your condition doesn't have to be one thing at a time. You can use the and or or, literally the words and or or, to evaluate multiple things at one time. So this condition, I'm evalu evaluating whether income NU is less than 35,000 and also greater than 25,000. So maybe 25,000 is my, they automatically qualify to use my services. 35,000, they automatically are disqualified from using my services. But anywhere in that 25 to $35,000 range for income, I need to ask subsequent questions. Like what are your expenses? How many children do you have? What's your household size? Things like that to figure out if they still qualify. And I, I can do that and I can evaluate that in between range here as well. It's important to note 
that you have to have that variable twice. You have to have two complete statements, two complete expressions. So as you can see here, it has to be income and you less than 35,000 and income and you greater than 25,000. You can't just do income and you less than 35,000 and greater than 25,000. This last part isn't getting evaluated. There's no variable basically that A to J associates with this expression. So just like writing a sentence, you need two complete sentences on um, either side of the and here. Last note on condition syntax, you can do simple mathematical expressions with it. So here I'm taking the income, I'm subtracting automatically $10,000, and then I'm evaluating whether it's greater than or less than $35,000. Um, just like standard math, you work left to right to evaluate the expression. You can use built-in A to J functions, which we'll talk about in the next section, to evaluate data. So here, this expression is saying, taking the variable user birthday DA, so they've given me a date in a month, month, day, day, year, year, year um, format. And I'm telling A to J to convert that to a number using age, so convert it to years, and then I'm evaluating whether they are greater than or equal to 18. Finally, when using functions, you must wrap them in a parentheses. So here, as with age, date has to be wrapped. And we'll talk about these functions in just a minute. So important things to remember, always use brackets with your variables. And if you're using functions, always use parentheses to wrap those functions as well. Here are some additional resources for you to look into if conditions are still tricky for you. This is the A to J Author 4.0 Authoring Guide. There's a couple pages specifically on the Advanced tab and how to create in, in Chapter 7, Creating Questions. Um, we also have a tutorial on our A to J Author, our old.a2jauthor.org website. Um, and we have a training video on YouTube specifically on creating conditions in 4.0 that you can use to review this as well. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how conditions are different in A to J Author 5.0, but I'm gonna pop out for a second to see if there are any questions. Feel free to raise your hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any new ones. So what I'm gonna do is go into our authoring website here. All right, so I am on a to jauthor.org. This is my um, home screen. It looks a little bit different than your home screen might because I have admin permissions on this one. But generally, this is what your home screen will look like. We have our main um, once, and this is once you are logged in and authenticated as an a to j author user. If you haven't visited our new website, you need to go to um, the, the website click sign up, it will then um, be put into a queue that we check um, and when we see that you're not spam, we send you an authentication email. In that email is a survey that you need to be fill, that you need to fill out before we can give you access to this authoring tool. So before you can access A to J Author 5.0, you need to fill out the survey that comes to your email. You should get that email um, within 24 hours, uh, 24 hours in a business week of setting up your new a to j author.org account. If you have any problems, you can email me or you can send an email to webmaster at a to j author.org. And that's the email account that that um, email should be coming from webmaster. Okay, anyway, so we we get logged into our new website and you want to access the authoring tools. So once you're authenticated, you filled out the survey, you can then go to the authoring tab and it pops up A to J author 5.0. This is um, a list of all of the interviews, the guided interviews that I've done, that I've used. If I keep scrolling, I can op open sample interviews here and we have um, one from New York State, a mobile online interview sample, Utah Legal Services online intake, and we actually have a sample repeat loop one that I created. Um, if you want to test those out. If you want to create a brand new guide to interview, you click this blank interview up here. For uploading 4.0 guide to interviews to 5.0, you would click this upload A to J guide to interview right here. Up pops a list of all your files, and you'd be able to select your 4.0 interview. Click open, and it would populate this list. So I did that 
um, a couple of days ago when I was creating this inter this um, guide to interview for today to make sure that conditions were working properly. So this is actually a five a four point interview that I uploaded into five point Double click on it to open it. So here I was on my list of interviews. You can either highlight and click open, or you can double click and it will open your guided interview for you. So here we'll walk through um, the sample guided interview. If I want to op open up a question, I just double click on the question and up pops the question design window. In 4.0, there was a lot of tabs on the side that you had to click through to get to the different sections. Here you just scroll. So page information, question text, fields, buttons, and the advanced logic. And if I want to go into preview, and we'll just walk through this in preview and I'll show you the different ones. So this is my preview screen. This is how my end user would see the guided interview. If I want to open up the variables or the scripting, I click that button. I also close it. You can also access it by clicking our logo. Either one works. And as I walk through this guided interview, you'll be able to see the script fill out to show what's going on in the back end. So we enter a name and select a gender. When I select the gender, the user avatar populates as well. This is our new female user avatar. If we go back, that's male. That's our male avatar, a new user male avatar. We'll make it female for consistency. Okay, so date of birth. It's asking for my date of birth. When I click into this box, a calendar pops out. This is actually um, one of the conditions that I have set up. So um, let's do a birth date that makes me less than 18. Say my birthday was October 1st of 2000. All right, over here, I'll get the highlighter so you can see. Over here is my condition, far left. And the condition is testing for whether the client's date of birth, right here, is less than 18 when converted by the function age. And we'll talk about the age function in just a minute. But it is true, so it's green. So when I put in a birth date of 10-1-2000, um, Ada J. Author recognized that that is less than 18 years old. They're only 14 this month. Um, so they're not proper to use this form. So it took them to the sorry, you don't qualify question. If we go back, and I answer that question by giving it a birth date well within um, 18 years. So let's say October 1st of 1984. That same condition is false. You can see it right here. It's red and it's stri it's stricken through, so you know that this condition was false. But they are not less than 18 years old because their birthday is in 1984. They are 30. Instead, A to G author just continues with normal branching, so they are old enough to use this form. So instead of having to ask the end user, what is your birth date, and then are you over 18, you can just ask them one question, what is your birth date, and use a condition on the back end. Here's another neat feature. I'm using a macro to call out the name the end user has given me. So I'm personalizing this question specifically for this avatar. And then she, she's already told me her name is Jane. So let's use that information. So Jane, what is your household income for the last tax year? This is a learn more. What counts as household income? If I pop it up, it explains you should include any money earned or benefits received by any person living in your house. I can close that learn more. In this learn more, you could also have audio, um, you could have video, and you can have graphics as well. So let's say the income is 26,000. All right, I have a condition on this question. So is the income greater than 35,000? Let me get my highlighter out again so you can see this one. So evaluating this first condition on that last question, if income and you is greater than 35,000, well, 26,000 is not greater than 35,000. So 
it's set income too high TF to false because they're not too high. However, if is income between 35,000 and 25,000, yes, that condition is true. So we need to go to this subsequent question about asking about how many people live in the household. So here, household size, say three people. Let me erase that drawing, sorry. Here, if people in household equals one, then um, you would move on. You, they wouldn't qualify because their household income doesn't drop it down. However, their household size is three, so they're going to be they're going to fit. I can, they can continue using this form, um, so it moves them on to the next question. There's also logic on this question, the "Are you pregnant?" question. On this "Are you pregnant?" question, this isn't a relevant question to ask a male end user. Um, so before you can see logic before question. If user gender equals male, then it wouldn't display this question. But because this condition is false, it's red, you know it's false, then it goes on and asks the question. So you can see asking question. So are you currently pregnant? Let's say no. How many children do you have? Three. And then it keeps going on. Um, here's that one. If number of children and u is greater than one, which it is, because I it's three, I said I had three kids, then set this variable child or children te to children. Then the interview goes on with the legal question, we used a lawyer, and gets to the end. If we go back into A to Jath, you can see, um, I wanna see all the logic that I have running back here. So I go to my all logic tab, and I see that on income, multiple conditions, I'm checking if their income's too high, I'm checking if they're in that in-between range, I'm checking how many people are in their household. If it's one, then they've been in this, if they're in this in-between range and they only have one person in their household, then they don't qualify to use my interview. Checking that date of birth thing and I'm converting it from a date into a number here with age. On the pregnant condition, on the pregnant question, I'm, I'm checking whether um, the user is a male or a female. If male, they don't ever show the question. If female, then they will display that question. And then my final condition is checking um, whether number of children is one or greater than one. If it's greater than one, then it's children. If it's less than one, then this variable is child. Setting the conditions in 5.0 are a little bit different than setting them in 4.0 because you're not using that plus button, you're not clicking things, you're actually typing if else statements. So it's a more similar to hot docs in that you are typing out if, typing out the variable, last step, typing out the operator, and then the number. You're using go to, you're using set, if, else, all of that is, you're not being prompted like you were in 4.0. But if you have 4.0 interviews that you upload, into 5.0, they'll automatically be changed into this um, format, and then you'll be able to edit them as you need. If at any time you guys have questions about specifically doing conditions in 5.0, our authoring manual will cover it, but you can always email us um, and we can provide you some tech support on that as well. So I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint, and we'll talk a little bit about functions. So we're gonna talk about seven specific functions that are most commonly used in A to J author. Date, today, age, has answered, ordinal, dollar, and sum. And then we'll talk a little bit about reminders as well. The first one, um, the first thing to talk about is what are functions? Functions are built-in actions performed to alter data collected. The format for the function is whatever function you're using, parentheses, remember you have to wrap variables with functions, and you have to bracket your variable name because there's a space in it. So whatever function you want to use, parentheses, bracket, variable name, close bracket, close parentheses. Where can you use functions? You can use functions in two places. In the text displayed to the end user, accept the learn more question, 
The learn more question is the thing the end user's avatar thinks. So you can use um, functions in the answer the guide avatar gives and the question text itself. So any text except the learn more question. And you can use functions in conditional statements, which I showed you in, in age in that condition before. But here is age again. So I'm using the age function to convert date of birth, um, um, month, month, day, day, year, 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 to a number. So talking about the date function, it converts days into month, month, day, day, year, year format. Um, where can you use it? So a common place to use it is to determine a deadline, say for an answer 30 days from the notice date. That's an example. So you ask the question, on what day, on what date did you receive notice? That's the first question here that I have in the screenshot. This is the avatar from 4.0, in case you've never seen it before. On what date did you receive notice? The end user tells me they received notice on 10, 23, 2012. On this same question, after I gather that notice date, DA, my subsequent question then says, you must file a response with the court by, and I use this syntax right here. I use a variable macro, which calls out the information, um, the, the answer held within a variable, calls it out in specifics. So I use a variable macro around this function. Date, and I do the notice date, whatever they've told me, so 10-23-2012, I add 30 days. Now that's 30 actual days, it includes weekends. Um, and then I convert that number, that day, into date format. So instead of saying to the end user, you must file a response within 30 days, you can say, you must file a response by 11-21-2012. You can be specific to the end user instead of being more general with that, well, you have 90 days to reply or you have 30 days to reply, that kind of thing. Or your statute of limitations runs out in 90 days after the incident. You can say, when did the incident happen? And then you can say your statute of limitation runs out on this specific date. The today function returns today's date specifically. So here, um, an example of where to use it would be to determine if the end user is within a 90-day statute of limitations. So this is an advanced condition, and I ask, when did the incident of discrimination occur? They say 10, 29, 2012. I take today, the word today, minus whatever they've told me as the incident date, and evaluate whether that is greater than 90. If it's greater than 90, they're gonna get kicked out and said, I'm sorry, you don't qualify to use this guy to interview. If it was less than 90, then they could continue filling out the form. The today function is also helpful for limiting um, calendar ranges. So perhaps on this question, when did the incident occur? You don't want them to be able to put in incidents that have occurred in the future. You don't want them to put in a date for the future. So you limit the range of uh, dates that are shown to the end user from a minimum of today, you type in the word today, and then a maximum of whatever you want. This is important because AdaJather automatically updates it with today's date, whatever date the end user is accessing it, and you don't have to um, every year change this or try and keep this updated, which would be crazy if you had to redo this interview all the time. So if you use the today function, um, you can save yourself a lot of time and you can also customize things for the end user. The age function you've seen before in the examples that I showed you with conditions, but it converts a date to an age in years. So um, a, a form might only be allowed to be used by people over 18, but the form might also ask for a person's birth date. So instead, of having people who actually qualify to use the form have to say that they're over 18 and then give you your birth their birth date, you can just ask the one question of when is your birth date and use um, this advanced condition to evaluate whether they are older or younger than, eight, than 18 and whether or not they can use the form. The has answered function, it returns a true false variable if a variable has a value. 
So where do you use this? An example would be you ask an end user for their first, middle, and last name. However, your line in your hot docs only has space for one name, one variable It's going to fit there. So instead of using a complicated computation variable in hot docs, you can just use the variable client name full TE, and you can test in A to J author. You can test whether middle name has, has been answered using has answered. So have the answered middle name. If true, combine first, middle, and last name into that new variable, client name full TE. If false, so they haven't put a middle name, combine first and last name into that new variable, client name full TE. Whenever possible, I like to do the computation part in A to J author. At least for me, I think it's a little simpler. So it might be helpful for you to do these instead of trying to come up and build computations in hot docs. And has answered lets you test. The ordinal function is the fifth option here. Um, it returns the ordinal form of a number. So first, 15, 15th, 134th. Um, you would use this, for example, in a repeat loop. Repeat loops we will talk about during next week's supplemental training session. But real quick, a repeat loop lets you ask the same questions over and over, no matter how many times the end user needs it. So instead of asking um, about their child name, child date of birth, child address, and making an infinite number of questions, you can build one repeat loop and then ask them how many times they need to go through that loop. So here, you can use the ordinal. So how much is your first asset worth? How much is your second asset worth? Third, how much is your 44th asset worth? Um, it lets you use the ordinal. And then the syntax here is ordinal, uh, parentheses, asset count. You can see I don't have brackets around my variable here because there's no space. So it don't need it because there's no space. However, it's probably best practices to just put brackets around my variable as well. Second to last is the dollar function. Dollar formats a number with a comma and two numbers after the decimal point. Um, where do you use this? So a user might not format their answer correctly. They might just type in 112,000 as total asset value. You can use dollar function to convert that to 112,000 comma 000.00. Um, and the way to do that is using the dollar function. So dollar parentheses bracket, Whatever number they've told you is their total asset value, close bracket, close parentheses. Finally, we have the sum function. The sum function returns the total value of all values entered for a repeating variable. Where would you use it? For example, you could use, you could have a guided interview that asks a user for the value of each of their assets collecting those values as client asset value and you. You then could use the sum function to total all of those up. So you would have client asset value and you, and it would store the house that's worth 100,000, the car that's worth 10,000, and the jet ski that's worth 2,000. Using the sum function, we'll combine all those into a total of 112,000. And then you could display that to the end user and verify with them whether or not that is correct. A couple syntax reminders. The functions dollar, ordinal, and sum need parentheses to work. They will not work without parentheses. So a good rule of thumb is to use parentheses and then also the brackets anytime you use a function. Variable names with spaces must be wrapped in brackets. If you do not wrap it in brackets, it will break because it has a space. And then finally, to show the value of a variable or a function, you use percent signs. However, this is in 4.0. Use percent signs everywhere in 4.0. In 5.0, you cannot use the double percent signs in any advanced condition. You can use it in learn mores or in question text to call out the value with a macro, but you cannot use it in condition. So this is a big change between 4.0 and 5.0. In 4.0, you could use a double percent signs. In 5.0, it will break your logic. 
So that is important to remember if you're switching from 4.0 to 5.0. That's actually in one of our FAQ questions as well. So to learn more about functions, you can go to our 4.0 authoring guide. Pages 114 to 115 gives you a chart of all the functions you can use, and it links to tutorials on each of those functions. So it has everything we talked about today, plus some other ones I didn't cover like trunk and round, which truncate and round numbers, either to um, the tenths place or the hundredth place. Okay. All right, well, thank you all for showing up for our supplemental training.